do it? What are we thinking about the hair? You like it? It's a little fluffy. It's a little fluffy. It's a little gray. It's a little gray. It's a little gray, but it was gray before. Now it's gray and fluffy. It's got a vitality. It's got sort of, I'm going for a Bernard Henri Lévy, modern French philosopher look. Huh? Yeah. All like right, that? stop it. Okay. Welcome to A Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. It's day 123 since I left my theater, but who's counting? I am by carving notches into my shin just to feel the passage of time. And it's beginning to seem like our four months of sacrifice may have been for naught because coronavirus cases are spiking all over the country. Even the states that did it right are now backsliding. For instance, yesterday, Governor Gavin Newsom announced a new wave of California closures as COVID-19 positive rates spiked there. They're shutting down again. Hollywood loves a sequel. This time it's shut down too. We opened up too fast and people are furious. Yesterday, Newsom instructed bars, movie theaters, restaurants, and zoos to cease indoor operations. Also closed are all indoor restaurant zoos like actual Panda Express. Oh yeah, oh they'll eat you. They run out of bamboo, they move on to the manboo. It was also announced that Los Angeles and San Diego have abandoned plans for even a partial physical return to classrooms. No in-person schooling. So bullies, you're gonna have to get the nerds to Venmo you their lunch money. And we know Trump wants to reopen the schools, and this is surprising, he's not wrong to want that. Because according to experts, during the first round of school closures, American children were set back on average by seven months in their reading and math learning. We're already seven months behind on math. If we fall another seven months behind, there will be no way to know how many months that is. But as bad as things are in California, as it says in their tourist logo, it's always worse in Florida. On Saturday, the Sunshine State broke the nation's COVID infection record, and yesterday, Florida announced another 12,000 new cases. Well, at least they don't have a lot of old people down there, or at least thanks to their governor, they won't in about three weeks. Yesterday, one infectious disease expert said this. Miami is now the epicenter of the pandemic. What we were seeing in Wuhan six months ago, five months ago, now we are there. Yes, Miami is the new Wuhan which is why Pitbull has changed his name from Mr. 305 to Mr. 282,000 cases. This has presented a problem for Florida governor and escaped museum exhibit Ron DeSantis. DeSantis didn't take the virus seriously, and now his state is the epicenter, but he's not worried. A lot of folks have been working a long time, really since March, uh, on this. I know we've had different you know, blips, and now in, a, now in a, a higher blip than where we were in May and the beginning of June. You see, surge is scary, but blip is just a fun word. Florida is having a big blip due to record cases of oops -a testes and over 4,000 zippity-doo deaths. But it's okay. It may not be that bad. Let's take a look at the curve in Florida. If you think that's just a blip, Governor, you've got blip for brains. Coincidentally, Florida is also the site of the upcoming Republican National Convention. They'll be fine as long as everyone remembers to wear their elephant plague masks. Trump moved the convention from Charlotte, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida, because North Carolina officials insisted on things like social distancing and masks for attendees. Wearing a mask blocks all the sensation. You can't even feel it when you reach nomination. I'm just going to take it off at the end and nominate myself. That joke stays in. That, that joke stays in. A lot of Republicans are planning to skip Trump's COVID coming out party, including Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri, Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas, Senator Charles E. Grassley, and Senator Lamar Alexander. Why are those guys so worried about going? Can we take a look at them, Jim? Oh my God, they're all beyond high risk. They are blips waiting to happen. They've got one blip in the grave. And it's not just seniors. As one GOP representative put it, everybody just assumes no one is going. Yeah, even the RSVP say, check one, not attending, what, no, or I'm ready, Jesus. But no one wants to get on Trump's bad side, so they're all ready with airtight excuses 
for why they're staying home. Take 84-year-old Senator Pat Roberts, who explained he would likely not be attending because he had some things to do in Kansas. And in any case, he didn't know what was canceled and what was not and whatever. Oh, I'd love to go, but I've already scheduled things, you know, Kansas stuff. Polish the tornadoes, meet the wheat, got to do the whatchamacallit with the who's his faces, not to mention put the doohickey on my thingamabob, and they're, oh, no, sorry, I can't hear you. My mask is going through a tunnel. I don't blame any of these people for not going. Not only is Florida the new epicenter, but in addition, party officials were considering docking cruise ships in the city's port to provide extra lodging. So, you're in Florida, spending all day in an auditorium full of screaming people who won't wear masks. Then you go home to sleep on a floating Petri dish. The only way it would be more infectious is if the dinner was an all-you-can-bob lasagna buffet. Of course, not everyone's afraid. One 80-year-old RNC member from Virginia says, it's a risk you have to take. You take risks every day. You drive down the street and a cement truck could crash into you. Ooh, that's a great idea for the finale of my speech. I get to drive a cement truck. Doot, doot. Hold still. Florida Representative Matt Gates is not concerned about who is and who isn't going, telling reporters, everyone in the media wants to act like it's some big deal that Susan Collins and Lamar Alexander aren't going to the convention. The octogenarians and septuagenarians of the Senate are surely lower than the number who have purchased their third Star Wars costume. Of course, Matt Gates comes with his own Star Wars costume. There may be a safer way, though, because Republicans are looking into holding their convention outdoors. That's right, an outdoor convention in August in Florida. I don't know if they've drained the swamp, but they better be ready to drain the swamp ass. I believe we have a preview of Mick Mulvaney delivering his keynote speech in the Florida heat. He looks good. He looks good. The solution to this rapid spread is as plain as the nose on your face, which I shouldn't be able to see because it should be behind a mask. But unfortunately for future Republican votes, people who don't wear masks seemed always to be Republicans. Take Texas Senator and man whose beard shrunk in the dryer, Ted Cruz. A fellow passenger recently photographed Cruz on an American Airlines flight not wearing a mask. Well, you can't expect Cruz to hide the moneymaker in that I would pay money to see less of his face. The airlines have a policy that passengers must wear face coverings during the flight. But Cruz's staff explained that the senator had just temporarily removed his mask to drink coffee. Ah, but the same passenger also took this photo of Cruz at the gate, also not wearing a mask. Come on, Ted. What's it going to take to get you to be a fan of masks? Have the masks call your wife ugly and accuse your dad of killing JFK? Repu That's based on a true story. That's based on a true story, that joke. Republicans are also attacking the most reliable person telling us to wear a mask, Dr. Anthony Fauci. The latest person to go after the good doctor is Trump advisor and paper football goalpost, Stephen Moore. Moore says that he's writing a memo that shows how many times Dr. Fauci's been wrong, not just during this pandemic, but his entire career, and he's been working on it for weeks. I wouldn't make that too long of a memo, Steve. Trump tends to lose interest on page any. Moore says Fauci's been Dr. Doom. Yes, Fauci's exactly like Dr. Doom. Greetings, Fantastic Four. Remember to stay six feet apart. Wash your hands for 20 seconds and be like me. Wear a mask or prepare to meet your doom. I want to keep your nana safe. <laughs> okay, while we were taping tonight's episode, just now, Trump sat down for a stand-up interview with CBS News' Catherine Herridge. And in this interview, he reminded us that as bad as he is dealing with the coronavirus, he's just as bad with race relations. Let's talk about George Floyd. You said George Floyd's death was a terrible thing. Terrible. Why are African Americans still dying at the hands of law enforcement in this country? And so are white people. So are white people. What a terrible question to ask. Mm -hmm. So are white people. 
More white people, by the way. More white people. Well, that's comforting. Such a terrible question. Let me stop you right there. Our brave policemen are killing all people. No lives matter. The topic then turned to, let's say, heritage. Would you be comfortable with your supporters displaying the Confederate battle flag at uh, well, political events? You know, it depends on what your definition is, but I am comfortable with freedom of speech. It's very simple. It depends on what your definition is of what? Of flag? Okay, I'll give you one. Confederate flag, noun, flappy thing. People in the South flew when they were fighting the United States so they could continue to enslave black people. Nothing? Okay, sorry, I forgot who I was dealing with. It's that X-y thing on top of the Dukes of Hazard car, okay? Now, Trump doesn't get what all the fuss with the Confederate flag is about. But you understand why the flag is a painful symbol for many people because it's a reminder of sa slavery. Well, people love it, and I don't view, I know people that like the Confederate flag and they're not thinking about slavery. They're not thinking about slavery. They're just thinking about the very fine people who fought to preserve slavery. Big difference, Kathy. Trump's lousy summer is about to get even lousier because today a new tell-all is released, and this one hits home because it's written by presidential niece and woman worried how you'll feel about her when you find out her last name is Trump, Mary Trump. Trump's own family is turning on him. He's going to have to keep an eye on his kids, and not just in case Eric gets his head stuck inside a birdhouse again. Mary Trump's book about her uncle is called Too Much and never enough. I believe she got the title after watching her uncle at an omelet bar. Trump's brother sued to stop the release of this book, but we're seeing it now because last night, a judge ruled that the book's discussion of the Trump family was not covered in their 2001 confidentiality agreement. Well, there's a red flag. What kind of family has a confidentiality agreement? All right, kids, it's family game night, but first let's sign this NDA that says no one ever learns that dad loses his when he lands on Park Place, okay? <laughs> Have that notarized. Mary Trump has known Donald Trump all her life and she does not hold back in the book. She says that Donald is not simply weak. His ego is a fragile thing that must be bolstered every moment because he knows deep down that he is nothing of what he claims to be. He knows he has never been loved. Hey, okay, that's not fair. We know he's been loved at least twice, $130,000 worth. Mary Trump writes a lot about Donald's dad, Fred Trump, labeling him a high-functioning sociopath. If only he had passed down the high-functioning part. We've got a great show for you tonight. Tom Hanks is here. Yes, that Tom Hanks. Stick around. You gonna stick around? Because it's Tom Hanks. Bye.